A 2003 Creighton alumnus, Mr. Kyle Korver has distinguished himself as one of the NBA's premier shooters in a 16-year professional career that includes two appearances in the NBA Finals and selection as an NBA All-Star. He has also used his unique position as a professional athlete to serve others and to speak out on issues of social justice including a recent seminal essay in the Players' Tribune on race and white privilege that has added significantly to the national dialogue. As a student athlete at Creighton, Corver helped guide the Blue Jays to NCAA tournament appearances in each of his four years from 1999 to 2003 earning All-American status in his senior season. He has been inducted into both the Creighton Athletics and Missouri Valley Conference Halls of Fame, and Creighton has retired his number 25 jersey. In addition to his success on the court, Mr. Corver is also noted for his philanthropy and community service. He has initiated coat drives for children in need, collected thousands of pairs of socks for a homeless shelter, sponsored construction of wheelchair ramps for families, reached out to at-risk youth, and traveled internationally in support of the NBA's Basketball Without Borders outreach program. And the Kyle Corver courts inside the Creighton Championship Center are named in his honor. At our morning ceremony, Creighton University proudly conferred upon Mr. Kyle E. Corver the degree of Doctorate of Humane Letters, honoris causa. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Kyle Corver. Good afternoon, parents, friends, faculty, and everyone at Creighton Community, in the Creighton Community, thank you so much for having me. It's the Creighton class of 2019, you did it! This is your day, and I am honored to be here celebrating with you. I want to give a special thanks to Father Hendrickson for inviting me. Uh, he reached out to me just before the playoffs started and asked if I would be free today. <laughs> Giving speeches isn't really my thing, but this is Creighton, my alma mater. I was excited and I wanted to say yes. <clears throat> but we were about to head into the playoffs, right? I said, May 18, that would be uh, the middle of the conference finals. You know what he said? He said, yeah, you know, uh, we looked at that. It appears you have Houston in the first round. <laughs> and, and, and if you win, you would probably play Golden State, the Warriors. I mean, I'm okay with penciling you in if you're okay with it. <laughs> but look at this arena. In my day, we, walked, we rocked out in the Civic. It's a little smaller. My last game at Creighton was actually the last game at the Civic. I'll be honest, I held on to a bit of a grudge. You guys are experienced this. You're gonna start, you leave today, and you're gonna start talking about the good old days. <laughs> right? I'm trying to let go of this mindset, but it's so cool to be back on campus. I look back fondly on my years at Creighton. I graduated with a major in visual communications. Is that still a major? No? And our basketball team went to four straight NCAA tournaments. I was even able to set a few school records. Thank you. But, 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 like I said, nothing stays the same. Some guy named Doug McDermott <laughs> swooped in and wiped them all out. Don't worry about it. It's okay. I'm not stuck in the past. 
I swear, except for when I guard you next time, Doug. <laughs> Come get an NBA record, Doug. <laughs> As your commencement speaker, I'm supposed to stand up here and give you my best advice, advice that I hope will help you over the next few years. So here we go. My best advice. How? To shoot a basketball. <laughs> There's a lot of ways to do this, but to me, it's all about having to be compact and strong. Your power is in your hands, it's in your hips, and it's in your feet. You gotta catch the ball strong, you keep your elbow tucked, and you finish with a follow through, right? And finally, Finally, this is the most important part. Don't just shoot it to shoot it. Shoot it to make it. And that, that's what I know. I think I'm done. No, I got some more. Don't worry. I worked on this. This is actually the second speech I've ever given. My first one was 19 years ago in my freshman speech class. I don't remember what it was about, probably basketball, but I do remember my grade. I got a nine, a nine out of a hundred. It's a long story, one that probably does not need to be fully told today, but today I promise I will do better than an F minus. But now that I've set the bar low, and I've got this shooting lesson out of the way, let's do this thing. Once again, congratulations. Class of 2019. It's a big deal, it's a big deal. And like Father Hendrickson said, there won't be many days in your lives like this one. Today is the day where you can press the pause button in between one big phase of life and another and get a chance to celebrate but also reflect. Life really does speed up after this. Just ask your parents. The second part of my job today is to offer you some wisdom before you head out into the real world, which I know you guys have heard lots about lately. Now I know what some of you might be thinking, what does a basketball guy know about the real world? I see my wife, she's nodding right now. And it's true, since college my job has been shooting baskets. I've worked hard at it and I'm proud of the work I've put in. Because hard work feels good, right? It feels good to work hard. But I also know how fortunate I am to do what I love for a living. It's not lost on me. I feel very grateful, and it's something that I wish for all of you to be able to do something that you love. But I don't just want to talk about basketball today. Because basketball is what I do for a living, but it's not how I want to define my life. I reject the idea that athletes should stick to sports or stay in their lane or shut up and dribble. Athletes are not some kind of one-dimensional sports robot, and the same goes for you. Each of you is made up of many parts, many interests, many opinions, many experiences. Own those. Share those. Don't let the world convince you that your voice isn't important. It makes me think of a quote by Saint Irenaeus. Irenaeus. God, I keep getting it wrong. In the second century, he said, the glory of God is a man or a woman fully alive. Fully alive. I love that. And that's what I want to talk about today. I'll get more to this later. But it's about, what, it's about the combination between what you do as a person and who you are as a person. What? And who? Let's start with the what. You guys know these. What job? What spouse? What house? What city? What 401k? What title? What awards? What hobbies? What do I got to do to pay off my school debt? School's expensive. And look, the what of your life is important. There's value in working hard and achieving your goals, which I found in basketball. But what you do for a living isn't the sum total of who you are as a person. And, your what, and if your what is your identity, you might be let down. When I was sitting where you are, 
16 years ago, I was nervous about where my career would go. Let me tell you a story about my first year in the NBA. From as early as I could remember, it was my dream to make the NBA. Just to make it in, you know? I loved basketball, but it was more than that. The NBA was the only thing I saw when I looked into the future. If I just made it, I thought, then I'd always be who I wanted to be. I would have everything that I wanted. And sure, the NBA is a job that gives you money, fame, and fans. But when I was a kid, the NBA dream, it wasn't necessarily about that stuff. It was about wanting to be the best at something and wanting the world to recognize it. So, I'm in your spot. The NBA draft is coming up. People said I had a chance, but it wasn't a lock. My year, 50 names came and went. It was looking pretty iffy. And then, during the last commercial break of the 2003 NBA draft, they came back from the commercial and I saw my name scroll across the bottom of the screen. Everybody went crazy. The 51st pick to the New Jersey Nets. I found out shortly afterwards that I'd been traded to Philly. I'm not sure if trade is the right word. I was more or less sold for an undisclosed amount of money. I later found out they used that money to pay for the entry fee for their summer league team. And with leftover money, they bought a copy machine. <laughs> What's your trade value? <laughs> Apparently mine is a copy machine. But it's OK. Because a couple years ago, that copy machine broke. <laughs> and I'm still playing. <laughs> oh, thank you. But the season started, and I found myself on the same team as the one and only Allen Iverson. By the way, all the credit in the world to AI. He was so encouraging, so encouraging to me. He would tell me, shoot or shoot the ball. Shoot it. Shoot or shoot the ball. It was a great voice for me to have in my head. But the NBA was stronger. It was faster. It was harder to get an open shot. Somewhere along the lines, I started to get the hang of it, though. I figured out my role. My rookie year, I played about 10 minutes a game. And I remember telling myself, OK, you're going to get about four to six shots. You've got to get a, hit enough shots to get to 10 points. That was my goal, 10 points. And everything seemed to be working out. I had made the NBA. Then, late in the season, something happened. About 60 games in, I woke up one morning in my apartment in Philly. I turned on the shower, and I got in. An hour later, I was still in the shower, but now I wasn't standing. I had laid down in it and the warm water had gone cold. I was a mess. I couldn't get myself to move. I was so incredibly sad. And then I got mad. I'm like, what is wrong with me? I'm in the NBA. I'm living the dream I had as a kid. I had all the comforts that success can get. And I was only 23. But I was empty. And I was anxious. I was miserable. And I didn't like seeing the person I saw in the mirror. Why wasn't this enough? Shouldn't everything be smooth sailing? I'm telling you guys, it was a pathetic scene, sitting on the floor, sniffling in that cold water. But I tell this story not to be all woe is me. I tell you this story because it was a moment for me. It shocked me. I wasn't supposed to feel that way. Our culture tells us that if you had the things that I have, you'd be comfortable, and you'd be happy. In that moment, I realized something. I already knew my what. My what was Kyle, three-point shooter, NBA. But up to that point, I hadn't really considered the who. I mean, maybe I had some, but there wasn't a lot of depth to my thoughts. Was I just a basketball player? What did I believe in? What was important to me? What did I really care about? What if it all went away? Who would respect me or like me if I wasn't Kyle, the three-point shooter guy? Sitting on the floor of the shower that day, I didn't have any good answers. But something shifted in my heart when I realized there was something missing from the dream that I was chasing. I'm 38 years old now, and I'm still searching and redefining who I want to be. It doesn't stop. And the impact I hope, and the impact that I hope to have outside of basketball. Do we have any history majors here? Yeah, 
Good couple. All right. Props to you. You picked a difficult major. We need more of you. Uh, but man, we need your insights now more than ever. Recently, I came across a quote from the late professor and historian Howard Zinn. He said, you can't be neutral on a moving train. Let me give you the context. It was the 60s, and Zinn was a professor talking to his students about the civil rights movement. His students, young people the same age as you, were studying you. It was history, and it was current events. But still, it didn't directly affect most of their lives. Like you, they were busy. Like you, they were just starting to figure out their own careers. And anyway, what could they do about it? Why should they care? You can't be neutral on a moving train. Here's what I think he meant. Like a train, life is happening. History is happening right now, whether we choose to take part in it or not. There is a world out there that is changing for good or for bad right now, whether we choose to take part in it or not. Our society is changing, whether we opt in or not. We have a choice to care or not. But you can't be on board the train, be a member of our society, and claim you didn't know you were along for the ride, because we all play a part. That was the 60s. Today we face our own urgent challenges. We still face deep inequalities in America, but they are easy for some of us to ignore. So Zinn's advice feels very relevant to me in 2019. In the real world, there is no neutral. Saying, I don't know where I stand, or that doesn't really affect me, that isn't being neutral. That's a privilege. Recently, I wrote an essay about race and privilege. In the essay, I wanted to say two things that have been on my mind for a long time. One, that I, Kyle Korver, a white man, have so many advantages in America just because of the color of my skin. And two, I wanted to encourage a conversation among white people about privilege, a conversation that is uncomfortable and often avoided. As the recipients of so much privilege, white people have the opportunity to not just oppose racism and inequality, but to actively work to find solutions. And I hope in some small way it reached people who want to join in on the conversation. But just that, that's a form of privilege too, right? Because I didn't say anything new or novel in what I wrote. People of color have been saying what I said for so many years. People who have been on the short end of these built-in privileges. Writing about this topic opened my eyes to my own blind spots, but I know there are more that I'm still uncovering. For years throughout my adulthood, it was easy to ignore things like systemic racism and privilege, because you know what? They didn't really affect me. And sometimes, when something doesn't affect you, it can become invisible. I mean, I knew at some level I was a part of a system that gave me so many advantages and marginalized others, but was I trying to do anything about it? Was I even trying to really understand? No. I was silent. I was neutral. As a white man, I could opt in to the conversation about racism and inequality, but I could just as easily opt out. I've almost always opted out. For people of color in America, and yes, even many NBA players, systemic injustices aren't something they get to opt in or opt out of. They're an everyday reality. I don't want to stand up here like I know what the solutions are, and I don't want my words to be taken away from the voices that are so often marginalized on these issues, and I certainly am not an expert on this topic. But it was important to me to begin to engage the parts of myself that were uncomfortable, and to be someone who simply cares, right? Someone who cares. <laughs> and
and to act like someone who cares. Who doesn't just sit by who doesn't ignore others in pain, especially if you can do something. Who doesn't accept the lie that some people are more deserving of dignity and opportunity than others. My grandfather is a retired pastor of a church in Paramount, California, where I was born. And he always tells me, and anyone that will listen, Kyle, my boy, we are blessed. But we are blessed to be a blessing. I've always liked that. Because it's another way to view privilege. We are blessed. And today, especially on your commencement day, you are blessed to be graduating, to be so smart and capable, to have so much life ahead of you, to be alive. Those are blessings. Those are privileges. But privilege calls for responsibility. I understand this can be uncomfortable. But know what you believe. Then you'll know where to stand. Because the real world won't tell you that. You'll find out that people have all sorts of moral codes, all kinds of motivations. And the real world will be full of distractions. You'll be giving lots of opportunities to choose what's easy. I mean, you could literally watch Netflix until you die and still have Hulu, Amazon, and TikTok memes that you missed while you were at the ceremony. Look, I'm not saying don't go get that well-paying job. Go get it. Working hard feels good. And money in itself is not bad. I'm not saying don't go buy that car or that vacation. Live it up. Comforts and fun are part of life. But we should be uncomfortable with the kind of comfort that comes at the expense of others. If you If you retreat to your own individual island in life and pretend that you aren't on this big train together, we all lose. We all lose out on your important voice, your unique contribution to the world. So let's reject the myth that we aren't all in this together, that caring about the me means you can't care about the we. Let's not sugarcoat it. This is a complicated world we live in, right? super complicated, and we face serious, urgent problems, and your generation has inherited many of them. But looking out at you, I want to believe that there is enough hope and heart mixed with brain and skill to do anything. There is good to be activated in all of you, to solve any problem you want, to create solutions, to be better to each other, in big and small ways. So yes, these are challenging times. They're complicated times. But a challenge is for rising to, not shrinking from. And out of a challenge comes opportunity. Class of 2019, my hope for you is that you can find purpose in your work, in your relationships, and in your adventures in life. But I also hope you can find meaning in how you engage with the world outside of yourself. Today is the day when you start building your legacy as graduates of Creighton. I hope many years from now, looking back, you can say, we knew what we believed, and we were willing to risk what it takes to act on our beliefs, even when it was unpopular or uncomfortable. We sought finding solutions. We opted in. Now, feels like a good bit of work. Feels like a lot of work, right? On top of it, like, Kyle, man, I just want to get a job. It's work. But it's good work. It's life work. Just know that through it all, if you do this work, you will become someone to be proud of. A man, a woman, fully alive. And we're counting on you. We're cheering you on. And lastly, remember, don't shoot it to shoot it. Shoot it to make it. Thank you.